You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change Podcast by Nori, the world's first carbon removal marketplace. Here are your hosts, Ross Kenyon and Christoph Jospe. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change Podcast with Nori. I am Ross Kenyon, sitting here with Christoph Jospe and Paul Gamble. We are in Lower Manhattan right now. We are in a Holiday Inn room. This is the, the first time we've ever done a podcast set up like this, totally reconfigured the space. I feel creative. I feel like that part of me was exercised this morning. My creative juices are definitely tickled. <laughs> there is a lamp dangling <laughs> off the table. Oh, yeah. We didn't realize how dusty the areas are behind <laughs> desks at the Holiday Inn. So if you work at the Holiday Inn and you're listening to this, um, please be sure <laughs> okay. to dust behind there. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest. It's truly an honor and a delight and a pleasure and all these wonderful things. We just learned there's the only thing she hasn't done is jump out of the airplane. But other than that, she's an incredibly accomplished person. We have Hunter Lovins. She is the president of Natural Capitalism Solutions, as well as a professor at the BARD program and MBA program in sustainability, as well as one of the co-founders of the Rock Mountain Institute, as well as a whole number of other great things that have to do with reversing climate change. And Hunter, you happen to be on the Reversing Climate Change podcast. So welcome. Thank you. And we like to begin our podcast with the story of the guest and sort of how they got to where they are today and why they think they're sitting on the Reversing Climate Change podcast. <laughs> what, a, what a way to phrase that one. Yeah. Well, that's an easy answer. You asked me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so how, how did you get here, Hunter? <laughs> Other than on an airplane from Colorado. <laughs> well, most directly, yes. Uh, <laughs> burning carbon to save the climate, which is kind of what we all do, eh? Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. You have to. How did I get here? Gosh, I don't know that I had a whole lot of choice. My... Uh, my mother worked in the coal fields with John L. Lewis. My father helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. They were around the house when I was growing up. So trying to make the world a better place is just what you do. That's some, some quality name dropping right wow. there. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, planted a tree for the first Earth Day, worked with David Brower in the 60s. And and in the seventies, he, he uh, coined the term right environmentalism. Is that no? I, I don't know who coined the term, mm. but he was our generation's John Muir Thoreau. He was mm. the first uh, executive director of Sierra Club. Got fired because he saved the Grand Canyon, thereby losing Sierra Club their tax exempt status. He took a full page ad out in the New York Times when Bureau of Reclamation was going to dam the Grand Canyon, and they said, "Well, but you'll be able to boat up." to the wall and see it better. What? He said, would you flood the Sistine Chapel to get a better view of the ceiling? Uh, saved the Grand Canyon and Sierra Club lost its tax status. The board freaked, fired him. He created Friends of the Earth. Then uh, about a decade on, that board fired him because he was uh, borrowing for operating expenses. He said, if you have a positive bank balance, you haven't realized the urgency of the situation. And uh, so he pivoted and created Earth Island Institute, which he ran until he died. Uh, Dave was the consummate, unreasonable environmentalist. Russ Train once said, uh, who's head of EPA, once said, Dave, be reasonable. He said, reasonable people have never accomplished anything. <laughs> Marvelous man, friend, fellow whiskey drinker and uh, <laughs> mentor. Then uh, what? In doing that, uh, at Amory Lovins, we teamed up. Uh, created Rocky Mountain Institute. I ran that for 20 years till they fired me. So I pivoted, created natural capitalism, and here we are. Along the way, helped create a couple of uh, MBA programs in sustainability, including the BARD MBA, where I now teach, which is what I'm doing here in, uh, in New York City. This is an MBA in which sustainability, climate protection, responsible leadership is baked into every class. It's not an elective. It's not a bolt-on. It, we believe it is the basis of good business in today's world. Yeah, uh, we were at an event last night that was on impact investing, and one of the speakers had a similar route and was describing how MBA programs 15 years ago, the sustainability component used to be almost like a tacked on, a little, little bit quasi greenwashing potentially. And now if you go to these programs, especially the ones that focus on it, it's 100% aligned. It's, it's fully integrated in a very meaningful new way. And I 
I'm not sure how recent that is, but when have MBA programs started to change and how are you trying to uh, shape the future business leaders of tomorrow? An old boy named uh, Dick Gray, Richard Gray, wrote me back in the 90s and said, did I think it would be a good idea to have an MBA around sustainability? And I wrote him back, said I thought it'd be a great idea. He uh, wrote me again in 2001 and said, uh, no, 2002, said uh, we were doing it. Would I come to San Francisco in August and help put the program together? I said, no, I'm uh, going to Africa for the World Summit on Sustainable Development. I had just been fired from Rocky Mountain Institute and uh, figured that was a target-rich environment where I could pick up new clients and begin to build a new practice. Dick said, when are you back? I said, well, not until the end of September. I'm not going to fly all the way to Africa and not go see animals. He said, well, we'll we'll wait the meeting until you get back. So the three of us who were the young staff at Natural Capitalism went to San Francisco, sat down and built a uh, the first MBA in accredited MBA in which uh, sustainability was baked into everything. The folk there said, well, we could have an MBA and then a class, an elective. And I said, dull, been done. Stu Hart did that at North Carolina some years back. I said, what we ought to do is have every single class taught from this perspective. How do you honorably do business at a time in which the world is in crisis? And they said, we don't know how to do that. Said so nobody knows how to do it. It's never been done, but let's go. So we did. Somehow I then wound up teaching there. Uh, in what was it, uh, 2009, I believe we were all at Copenhagen at the uh, conference of parties on climate. It was clear it was going to fail. I was sitting with Eben Goodstein, who uh, was then running the Bard program in environmental studies, and Eben said we're we're going to ally with a business school. I said, why don't you create your own? So we did. And that's the Bard MBA where I now teach. Wow. And uh, are people coming into the program there? They already hold these values. It's not something that you have to teach them. They're just they're just ready to find a way to both make money, but also be good stewards of the planet and be responsible uh, keepers, I guess you could say. We've had we have a delightful diversity of students. We have people coming off Wall Street, our class is classes are held a block and a half from Wall Street. We have people who say, I was never intending to take an MBA until I heard about your program, but this is what I want to do. And I argue that it doesn't matter whether you're running an NGO, as you guys do, as I do, whether you are a social change agent, just out being an activist, or whether you're an entrepreneur, or whether you want to work in a big company. The kind of program that we have at Bard teaches you what you need to know to most effectively drive change in the world. Among other things, it teaches you who you are. We have a whole program in leadership and personal development. We have a required entrepreneurial class. All of the first year students are part of a program called NYC Lab. We use the city as a living laboratory where in your first year, you get real clients, agencies, NGOs, companies who want an MBA team working with them. And it is taught by Laura Gitman of Businesses for Social Responsibility. So you learn how to be a sustainability consultant in a, uh, in a very professional way. My class, uh, Principles of Sustainable Management, introduces you to the basic literacy in environmental issues, in social issues. These are as much a question of diversity, of equity, of social justice, of a just transition, as they are parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's been trying to separate these issues that's gotten us into trouble. You have a, a number of examples uh, in, in your latest book, which I just read. It's A Finer Future. Yes. What, yes. what, is, what is the, the subtitle there? Or the... Creating an Economy in Service to Life. The book grew out of, well, the book grew out of several things. In 2012, the little country of Bhutan realized that if it wanted to play a leadership role in the world, it had to step up onto the world stage. So the then prime minister, a visionary man named Jigme Thinley, held a meeting at the United Nations, invited a group of us to come and 
talk about the possibility of taking Bhutan's concept of gross national happiness and making it the basis of international development policy. Right now, we all march to the beat of the neoliberal drum. The only thing that matters is growth. The only thing that matters is money. If you don't have any, you're not worth anything. We're all greedy bastards, but that's okay because it, the market is perfect. And in this perfect market, you against me will somehow aggregate to the greater good for all. No, it won't. It hasn't. What it has brought us is a world in incredible peril. The recent IPCC report has made it really clear. We've got about a decade to turn around climate change or we start losing the capacity of the planet to support life. We have high levels of inequality, some of the highest ever in history. The Handy Report, Human and Nature Dynamic Study, shows that collapse is actually fairly common throughout human history. When it happens, it lasts for hundreds to thousands of years. You really don't like it. It is driven by one or both of two things, high levels of inequality or you overrun your resource base. Hello, we have both. And the report, the, the study said, under conditions closely resembling those now on Earth, we find that collapse is very difficult to avoid. So here little Bhutan was saying, we have a different way forward. How about happiness? Now, we reframe that as well-being because happiness is not just, la, 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 I'm having a good time. It's truly being well in your life, in your being, in your community, in the world. So we started playing with Bhutan. Uh, the, they invited a group of us over, an international expert working group. And as part of that, the, the king and the prime minister said to me, Hunter, your job is to reinvent the global economy. I'm like, me? So I gathered the best folk I could find and said, what, what would that take? How would you reinvent the global economy? This led to working with scholars from around the world. We created a group called Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity with people like Dr. Robert Costanza, father of ecological economics, Dr. Jacqueline McGlade, who at the time was chief scientist for UN Environment Program, about uh, two dozen equivalent minds, uh, Richard Wilkinson, Kate Pickett, who wrote the book Spirit Level on the costs of inequality to society, and began this conversation. What would it take to reinvent the global economy? Then um, Dr. Michael Pearson at Fordham University, Dr. Chris Laszlo, Andrew Winston, who wrote the great book, uh, Big Pivot, about how businesses have to pivot toward a genuine commitment to sustainability, to radical transformation. And about 40 others of us created a group called Leading for Wellbeing to try to bring this well-being concept in got into a bit of an argument at the Club of Rome, which at the time I was on the executive committee of. Many of the members there are of the opinion stemming from the book Limits to Growth that, well, oh, we're all going to die. Yeah, we're all going to die, but not today. And there's a tremendous amount that we can do. As the original Limits book said, if we adopt principles of sustainability, we can solve the problems facing us. So a subset of us from the club, Stuart Wallace, who for many years ran New Economics Foundation, Anders Wiegmann, who runs climate policy for the Swedish government, John Fullerton, who was 18 years at J.P. Morgan, left and created a thing called Capital Institute to try to transform finance. The four of us got together and said, let's pull the best from all of these people, from all of these groups, and set it down in one place. What do we know about how to transform corporations, finance, energy, agriculture? What do we know about government policy that works, that can drive authentic change at the international level, at the national level, at the regional level, city level, and in your personal life? Is it possible? to build an economy in service to life. So that's what the book sets forth. Our answer, yes, it is. If we do it, 
we will be much happier, going back to Bhutan's great concept, and we'll also make more money. We can solve the climate crisis at a profit. And the best practitioners in the field are doing this. Carbon Disclosure Project, now badged CDP, has shown that the companies that are leading in measuring and managing their carbon footprint have 18% higher return on investment than the laggards, 67% higher than the companies that say, oh, climate change isn't a problem. We don't care. We're not going to do anything. This is just better business. That's great. And I sort of getting chills hearing you speak because it resonates with a lot of how I think we see the world, which is if we can align people's motivation to make money with actually making the world a better place, we can we can really change things quickly and we can drive a whole lot of solutions. You brought up a lot and there's a lot to unpack there, um, but I, w- I want to focus on solutions that s- some of which you pointed at. And there's also a book sitting right there on the table called Dirt to Soil. And I kind of want to get into the weeds and let's get dirty. Um, things things are happening, but they're not happening quickly enough. And we can sit here around our small little table in the Holiday Inn and say, hey, you know, the, we, we can make the world a better place, but it's not happening. We need it to go. It is happening. Not quickly enough. It's True. Going, it's not going, quickly enough. But, you know, uh, what William Gibson said, the future's already here. It's just not widely distributed. Right. Fair enough. So thank you for your correction. It is happening, but I want it to happen 100, 1,000 times as quickly. So so paint a picture for us. How how do you see this really scaling quickly? You, you gave us a sort of very tight timeline that was laid out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You know, we take this sort of fear and catastrophe as, well, it's not going to happen. It's the motivation for us to get it right. So... So can you paint a picture of how you see the future of these solutions scaling? Sure. Two things. Let's just for the moment talk about climate change. There there are many problems in the world, but let's take the big existential one. How the hell do we solve climate change fast and at a profit? Two steps. First of all, listen to the man Tony Seba, Stanford professor, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Tony says, inevitably, for fundamental economic reasons, the world will be 100% renewable by 2030. There's our time frame. How could this be? We run on massive flows of fossil energy. We all fly around on jet planes burning fossil energy. 10 years time? Is this possible? Tony says four things will drive this. Fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of storage, batteries, the electric car, the driverless car. Mm -hmm. After the 2016 election, I went and had a chat with Tony. I've known him for a decade or so and said, okay, now it's not possible. He said, oh, now I'm even more convinced. So I started looking at the evidence. 2017 uh, piece out in um, Green Tech that solar would fall below 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour. You know, in all of our lives, solar's been 20 cents a kilowatt hour, 15, 12, the, falling. The average American energy bill is around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. 10, 10 to 12. Yeah, Here in New York, context. it's like yeah. 18 or uh-huh. 20. In Seattle, it's six. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because you have a lot of hydro. Right. So 10 cents a kilowatt hour starting to become a, a reasonable number, but below two cents. Saudis did it. They bid a 800 megawatt field at 1.7. The recent Colorado bids, our coal-loving utility, Excel Energy, said, who can supply us 1,100 megawatts at any price from any source? The bids came back. They, they were sure natural gas would win. Natural gas came back at around $0.04. Cents. Wind at a bit below $0.02. Cents. Solar at a bit above $0.02. Cents. Wind plus solar plus batteries, $0.03. Cents. Excel said, no way. Wow. Bid it again. <laughs> And the numbers came back essentially the same with the stupid tariffs slightly higher. Still, there was no fossil bid below four cents. And those were median bids. What that means is there is a great deal of wind and solar on offer at around or below two cents a kilowatt hour. And that's subsidy free, right? All energy is wow. subsidy, has subsidies. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and I and the rest of the world's taxpayers pay, what is it, $5.3 trillion mm-hmm. a year subsidizing fossil energy. The fossil subsidies are vastly higher than any renewable subsidies. I'm a free marketeer. Capitalism is our middle name. I would love to do away with all subsidies, and I believe in the tooth fairy too. 
but <laughs> <laughs> the, these are real commercial bids in today's market. So Tony's right on the first item, fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of batteries. Elon Musk's batteries are, when well, this was the, again, the Colorado bid, solar plus wind plus storage batteries, cheaper than any fossil bid. Elon's big battery in Australia, when they had a power outage recently, responded in a fraction of a second, handled it. The utility said, oh, this is way faster than natural gas could have scaled. And that's the business that Tesla's in. They're not a car company, right. although they their market cap is a roughly General Motors. They sell, what is it, 300 times fewer cars, although Tesla is now one of the best selling cars in the United States. But still, Tesla's really a battery company. Right. There are 20 gigafactories for batteries going to come online in China by 2021. What is it? Uh, Five million companies here in the United States would economically benefit from putting batteries in to deal with the couple hours a day of peak pricing. Mm -hmm. For example, in Tucson, peak price is 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Off peak is five. Put in the batteries and you avoid that massive peak. Now there is storage as a service. You don't even have to put in the batteries yourself. You just buy the capacity for the couple hours a day you need it. Now, if you have renewables plus storage, you have fixed firm power, 24-hour power. The electric car, I drive a Leaf. Many of my friends who can afford it drive Teslas, and they love them. I love my Leaf. My husband's a horseshoer. He's a cowboy. He calls it the hippie car. He was sitting at a stoplight the other day, and there was one of these big coal rolling trucks blowing diesel smoke on him. Light changed. He left them in the dirt. <laughs> he loves it. He loves the torque. He loves the performance. Electric cars are just better cars. When I bought it, was sitting there, the guy was going through the paperwork. He said, oh, you don't need this. I said, what's that? He said, it's the emissions report. Oh, right. He said, man, you don't need that. I said, what's that? He said, it's the maintenance schedule. How do you maintain these things? You rotate the tires. Isn't it like five moving parts in a Tesla or something? 20. Like that? 20, okay. Compared to a thousand or more in an internal combustion engine car. China has said they're going to phase out internal combustion engines, along with India, along with many of the European countries. I think Denmark just said by 2030. Yep, yeah. by 2030. There's yeah. that number again. These things are going to sweep. Now, the question is, oh, and then the uh, autonomous vehicles. If you could get on your smartphone, whistle up an AEV, it takes you where you want to go tenfold cheaper than what you today pay to buy, maintain, fuel, and insure a private vehicle, why on earth would you own a car? Even Goodstein, who runs the BARD program, was talking to a guy from J.D. Powers, said, uh, how soon can I, up in upstate New York, be able to whistle one of these things up to take me to the BARD campus? The guy said, 2023. Bill Gates once said, we overestimate the speed with which things can happen in the next two years. We underestimate the speed with which things can happen in 10 years. This is a revolution that is upon us. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If Tony's right, and I think he's more right than wrong, we are looking at the dissolution in value of oil, gas, coal, uranium, nuclear, the utility industry, the auto industry, the banks that hold paper in them, the insurance companies and pension funds that are invested in them, this is going to be the mother of all disruptions coming at us faster than we have any clue how to manage. We are going to reinvent everything. And in so doing, we solve half the climate crisis. Now, you mentioned uh, Gabe Brown's book. This book is literally just out. It arrived on my desk the day I left Colorado three days ago. Dirt to Soil. Who the hell is Gabe Brown and why should you care? Gabe is a North Dakota corn soybean farmer who was going broke. And in the book, he describes the extent to which he took over his wife's family's farm, tried to farm it conventionally, and was losing money every year. So he said, how do I cut my costs? First, he went to no-till agriculture. He stopped inverting the soil. When you plow and turn the soil upside down, 
it decarbonizes. It denitrifies. Nitric oxide is uh, another greenhouse gas. So he stopped that. That cut a lot of his cost. Then he started planting cover crops. That cooled the soil. That's important because soil is not dirt. Soil is a living community. There are billions of microbes, mycorrhizal fungi, nematodes, all these little creatures that live in the soil that we've never thought had any particular value. So we spread pesticides, herbicides, try to get rid of them, thereby turning soil into dirt and spending a lot of money. Gabe quit all of that. He realized that that living community in the soil was what enabled it to hold moisture. So when he'd get a heavy rain, it no longer ran quickly off, eroding the nutrients in his soil. Furthermore, that microbiological community fixes nutrients in the soil. Now he doesn't have to apply fertilizers. So he's cut his cost for pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. He has healthy soil. Then he brought on animals, grazing animals. When the first pioneers came across the American Great Plains, they found 10 feet of thick black soil. That black is carbon. How'd it get there? The action of animals, dense packed because there were wolves, lions, mountain lions, going to eat them. If you're a bison and there's a wolf, the safe place to be is the middle of the herd. Everybody's trying to get to the middle. So they eat everything, their hooves chop up the soil, they fertilize it, and then they move on. They don't come back until the grass has regrown. This dense packing animal impact is what puts the carbon into the soil. And we can get into the science of it if you want, and, and Gabe does. But basically, that's why there was 10 feet of thick black soil when the first white folk came. They're now down to inches except on Gabe's farm, where he has gone from a little over 1% soil organic matter carbon to, on some of his paddocks, 11%. Gabe is rolling climate change backward. Profitably, he has gone from going broke to now being wildly profitable, selling a diversity of crops, corn, soybeans, oats, vegetables, eggs, chickens, cattle, sheep, goats, and solving the climate crisis at a profit. So you combine what Tony Seba is doing with cutting our use of fossil. You add what Gabe and the folk at Savory Institute who invented this approach are doing in taking carbon out of the air, putting it back in the soil where it's a nutrient, not a pollutant. We've solved the climate crisis at a profit. Now, how fast can we do that sucking of carbon out, putting it back in the soil. We don't know is the short answer. Marin Carbon Project, which is taking dairy manure and composting it and spreading it on pastures, is getting about a ton per hectare per year. So about a half a ton per acre per year. Gabe is obviously getting much faster uptake. Dr. David Johnson at New Mexico State University is doing something like what Marin Carbon Project is doing and getting up to 10 tons per acre per year. Wow. Yeah, big numbers. That's the biggest one that I've heard to date. He actually gets some higher, but um, he, he's happy to hold at 10. If you take the best science of holistic grazing, the work of Savory Institute, and you take all the world's grasslands. The world's grasslands are the second largest carbon sink on the planet after the oceans. So that's a big if. Over 30 years time, applying holistic management, you'd get back to 280 parts per million concentration of CO2. These are numbers from, and, and these are back of the envelope calculations, but they're pretty good numbers from a team at Tufts University and the group at Soil for Climate, Seth Itzkin and Carl Tinneman. So that's a, again, that's an illustrative number. We, we need to nail these numbers down. We need to see how fast farming, like what Gabe Brown is doing, can multiply. But you're starting to have these examples all over. Joel Salatin in Swope, Virginia. Will Harris down in Bluffton, Georgia. And I've been to these places. You go down to Will's 
operation. Is that the white oak or something white like that? White oak pastures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's got Bluffton. a lot of tree range chickens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which are getting eaten by bald eagles. Yeah, we mm-hmm. told that story on the show, yeah. <laughs> so Will says, well, you're supposed to tithe to the church. I guess I'm tithing to nature. It's <laughs> a good line. But he said, if everybody did this, the eagles would spread out. Mm-hmm. Then everybody would get to view bald eagles. Will is profitable. He hires 137 people. His neighbor commodity peanut farmer hires four. This is better for community economic development. And you drive into the little town of Bluffton, which you can see it it was decaying, being covered with kudzu, except where Will's operation is, where they're rebuilding the buildings. People have jobs. People are regaining pride in their community. Oh, and it tastes better to eat this stuff. It's more nutritious. It's it's just better for everything. It's better for the soil. It solves the climate crisis. It's more profitable. It's healthier for you. And it's more fun. Yeah, we love it. Whenever you can get the profit motive uh, embedded in something that has a result that you actually want that is good for the planet, then I think you're able to scale. We think that the line that we always use is you can get a lot of mileage out of out of altruism, but we've almost gotten all of it that we can, and you need to appeal to greed in some way to, to really scale. So if you can have all those forces working together, that seems like that's the sweet spot, right? Well, the sweet spot is what Kate Rayworth calls donut economics, below the planetary boundaries, but above the human minimums where you are providing sufficiency for all, genuine equity, and that safe and just operating space is where we ought to be heading for. And again, you're, you're spot on. It's more profitable. Now, the old neoliberal narrative turns out to be scientifically wrong. This notion that we're greedy bastards and therefore we have to appeal to greed. If you look at the archaeology, if you look at the evolutionary biology, anthropology, when humans first came down out of the trees in Africa, actually pre-humans, there were a bunch of species of us. Most went extinct. Those who survived, our ancestors, and thus why we are sitting here today, cared more for the good of the whole than anyone cared for him or herself. We know this from the DNA and from the archaeology. They found this little tribe of pre-humans, and they were down to fewer discrete individuals than the now endangered gorillas, cared for the elderly. They cared for cripples. They cared for the good of the whole, and they worked together. Ross and I recently both read uh, the book Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging by Sebastian Junger. It's actually quoted in uh, Hunter's book. Oh, Uh, well, (laughs) fantastic. Uh, Thanks. I meant to tell you that. that, That's why you read these. Uh, (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I love that concept. And and it's a really great book and has some interesting insights into the, the ways that bring like people come together and actually feel happier during times of great strife. And because we have this like genetic need to be able to bond with people around us and feel equitable and so on. Yeah. Right. We're, we're wired to cooperate. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that excites us so much about building Nori and sort of from the ground up. You know, we're not waiting for the UN to come with some edict and say, you must do this or even a compliance market. We're saying, no, we know that the world needs carbon removal certificates. So let's build the open source code that will allow people who can sequester carbon in their soils and future methodologies that we plan on hosting in our platform so that this is a way that we can cooperate and sort of drive the change that we'd like to see even more quickly. Well, I've been keen to meet you folk. I've been following what you've been doing. I did a little work earlier this year with Viridium out of the UK. We've talked to Todd a little bit. And they were basically going to commoditize uh, keeping standing for a standing. And I said, cool, insufficient. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing to keep standing for a standing. No, no criticism there. But if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we've got to be pulling carbon out of the air, putting it back into the soil. And then you guys pop up. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, cool. Somebody is doing this. So thank you for, uh, for having <laughs> me on and giving me a chance to meet you guys. I'm very keen on what you're doing, blending the economics with the meaning. The anthropologists tell us humans have four drives, acquire, 
and defend. That puts us on a plane with all animals. We need food. We need shelter. Once we have it, we want to protect it. But what makes us human is we have a drive to bond and a drive to create meaning. And what you're doing with Nori is giving people both of those last two, the ability to work together on behalf of something that's greater than ourselves, on behalf of a cause, <laughs> saving the planet, saving our home. We now have a thousand people missing in Florida from Hurricane wow. Michael. We don't know where they are. You know, here's hoping they are alive. They're with friends. They, they just got out of the area. We already have two dozen or more dead because of a climate change worsened hurricane. These are going to keep hitting the Caribbean. Germany, we've had hurricanes hit Germany, the UK, cyclones hitting all over Southeast Asia. We had a hurricane hit uh, Mexico, the Pacific coast. The weather is getting worse. I mean, I've, years ago, I called it global weirding. <laughs> it's weird everywhere, but it's not good. Droughts are ever more. The scientists tell us by 2040, the Mideast will be too hot to be habitable. Where are these people going to go? We solve the climate crisis or we lose everything we care about in our communities, in our families. And again, we know how to do it profitably. So thank you for all that you do in enabling people to become a part of this solution. That's uh, wow. so nice. Thank you, uh, Hunter. I, for some reason, I, I de-emphasize sometimes the, the the focus on on meaning because I can be a little bit of the hard nosed one around here. Where like uh, <laughs> uh, and, environmentalism is full of cliches. No one cares anymore. They've heard the save the planet mumbo jumbo a million times. And what if you could make a lot of money removing carbon, and that could help. But yeah, maybe we should uh, be focusing more that direction too. Because obviously, I mean. I'm going to confess, I many of the economists that you you uh, harp on are I'm, I'm I'm a fan of. Although I also love Jane Jacobs and <laughs> Eleanor Ostrom too, so I hope we can be friends. If I also like Hayek, I hope we're <laughs> I hope we're okay there. Well, you take the original neo libs; they were trying to do a good thing. Ludwig von Mises was appalled at what National Socialism had done to trash Europe. Hayek was scared to death of the rise in the East of Soviet collectivism. And the Soviet system murdered millions of its citizens. Friedman believed the individual was the only legitimate economic actor. They put neoliberalism together to fight what had just trashed the planet in World War II mm -hmm. and what they feared would trash the planet going forward. I think they just missed a little of it. The individual is important. An individual human dignity is core to our sense of happiness. So I think we need a new ism. And not, I've been putting not. this out to students. Name it. Somebody <laughs> came up with the name Humidity <laughs> yesterday. Sounds like a tech company. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they make dehumidifiers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the trouble is you take all the isms, communism, socialism, capitalism, neoliberalism, and they've all failed. We stand on the edge of a precipice in which we could lose humanity. Now, you know, George Carlin said, save the earth. The earth will be fine. It'll shake <laughs> us off like a bad case of fleas. Yeah, but we love that. <laughs> I'm a little sentimental about this human experiment. I would like to see all of the great things that humans have created endure indefinitely. That, you know, the, the definition of sustainability, the ability to sustain. But the way in which we're going to do that is going to be very different than any of the isms we've had so far. I work a lot with John Fullerton, who, as I said, came off uh, J.P. Morgan. He's got an approach that he calls regenerative capitalism, mm -hmm. and he's laid out eight principles of what a system has to be to operate in accordance with the principles of nature. Things like right relationship, Peter Brown's phrase, owes to the ecological economists of the economy is this little system within society which exists within the biosphere. Your relationship with your family, if you're in wrong relationship, you're not happy. Your body's relationship with its parts, this concept of holism and having all of the pieces working as a functional whole. 
empowered participation where you have a say in the forces that are affecting you. Circularity, the circular economy, the circulatory system in our bodies. Edge effect abundance. This comes from Janine Benyus, the great biologist, who says in nature, the most abundant ecosystems are where one or more come together because you have diversity. The Ability to entrepreneur, to be adaptive. Humans are entrepreneurial. When rabbits are threatened, they freeze. When humans are threatened, we entrepreneur. I mean, again, we can we can create better ways of living together. We have these guiding principles, which you know, as best John has been able to put, are what enables nature, natural systems to function. Perhaps the most important is honors place. We can have a vibrant global economy. I'm very fond of Scotch whiskey. We make very good whiskey in Colorado, but I just happen to like whiskey from the Isle of Skye. And we can trade vibrantly so long as every place, every ecosystem, every community has its own integrity. So John has just launched a program called Regenerative Hubs, We just started one in the Denver Boulder area. We were down in Costa Rica this summer. The country of Costa Rica wanted one, got down there, and the people in the territories each wanted one too. So I don't know, maybe they're going to be five in Costa Rica. Their territories are related to biosphere preserves, which are related to watersheds. So I started thinking, what's our watershed? Turns out it's the Upper South Platte watershed Mm -hmm. that just happens to include Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins. So we had a meeting last week where about 80 people came together from all over this bioregion and talked about what would a regenerative economy in Colorado be in our little piece of Colorado. People look at Colorado, they say you're an extractive industry state, you have oil and gas, mining, timber. Actually, that's a tiny piece of the economy. Nobody'd ever really counted Oil and gas is at most 6% of the Colorado economy. Colorado is much more about things like entrepreneurialism. We have a vibrant startup ecosystem where you have the entrepreneurs, the financiers, the incubators, accelerators, the outdoor industry, just the association just moved to Colorado, skiing, all of the recreation, tourism, education. We have a whole number of great educational institutions healthcare, services, clean energy, cannabis. These are all much bigger. Each one of these is a much bigger piece of the Colorado economy than oil and gas. Clean food, the natural foods industry is in many ways Mm -hmm. headquartered in Boulder. And so we're seeing all of these little regenerative farms and ranches springing up. No one piece of this has the sense of itself as anything other than insignificant. But you put them all together and that's the Colorado economy. So one of the things we're starting to do is make ourselves self-aware of the extent to which this regenerative economy is bubbling up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then realize if we invest in this, if if we work together as, if you will, a regenerative cluster, we can transform the economy of Colorado Then on a global level, we've created a thing called We All, Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is pulling together new economy groups from around the world, headed up by Stuart Wallace, whom I mentioned used to run New Economics Foundation. So that's at the global level. The hubs are at the local level. And you listening can join either of these, both of these, and do it in your community. Work with you guys at Nori to begin offsetting your carbon, work with your local producers to enable them to start getting credits for the carbon that they're putting into the ground at the same time that these producers are delivering to you healthier food and building your own regenerative economy locally. We can do it. We know how to do it. It's just a question of getting on about it. And yes, we can do it in the time set forth by the IPCC. (laughs) I agree. I'm kind of getting getting drunk on all the optimism you're you're feeding us. I I definitely look forward to 
to uh i don't think you could disagree with that if you had wanted to yeah no i've seen not, 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 check not, out, not check out the book a finer future creating an economy in service to life it has a hundred pages of footnotes <laughs> because every like assertion kind of book <laughs> every assertion we make is documented yeah it's happening somewhere I don't know. Is there is there anything else that we uh, we should cover that we missed? I think we got so much good content in there. Yeah, I <laughs> I, I almost feel bad for our uh, producer and editor and all of the uh, footnoting they're going to have to do for the show notes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep them to that same standard. It's real for you. easy. Uh, just pick up a copy of A Finer Future. The footnotes are all there. <laughs> do pick up a copy of Gabe Brown's book Dirt to Soil, oh, yeah. and. Those of you who are listening, do participate in Nori. This is a way that you personally can do your part to offset the carbon that your lifestyle currently causes. Oh, and we mentioned a lot about uh, we all fly around. Mm -hmm. Turns out there is a carbon neutral way of doing jet fuel. There's mm -hmm. a cool little company called Lanza Tech out of Chicago that has taken microbes, tuned them to take carbon flue gases and turn it into yoga pants and jet fuel. I love every example like that I hear from from plastics and polymers and, and uh, materials, consumer goods that come out of that. And then fuel. Is it? Wait, it's with microbes, though. It's not with algae. It's not with algae. It's microbes. Okay. And so you can tune the microbes to eat carbon flue gas from, say, a Chinese steel refinery or an Indian oil refinery or municipal solid waste. So now we know what to do with the plastics crisis. <laughs> yeah, that one gets me really excited. And also, yeah, Gabe Brown, if you are listening, we're coming for you. Just, just know it's a matter of time before you're on the show. We really want you. We like Gabe, what you're doing. Thanks for all that you're doing. You're, you're showing the way. You know, along with Joel, along with uh, with Will Harris, along with all of the regenerative producers, and real kudos to Alan Savory, who showed us the way of how to do regenerative agriculture. To Robert Rodale at Rodale Institute, who showed us how to do regenerative vegetable production. To people like Vandana Shiva, who's doing it in India. To Wangari Mathai, who was tree planting across Kenya. There are so many examples the world around of people who are, who are building a finer future, who are creating this economy in service to life. In your community, find who they are. Go meet them, shake their hand, and join them. This is wonderful. Thank you, Hunter. It absolutely sort of hits the nail on the head. The sort of more interconnected we are, the more complex we are all going to become more resilient. So I certainly, I think this was our best podcast yet. I'm looking forward to the time when we can <laughs> come out. almost every three podcasts. Well, <laughs> well no, this, this set the bar even that, higher. That can still be true. Though. Yeah, it, it's easy because it's the latest one we've done. But we'll be out there in Colorado with a bottle of scotch and hopefully you'll open your door yeah. and we'll is, get to share it. Is yeah. Lag Lagavulin okay? Or you like the sky one? So. <laughs> I'll drink Lagavulin. That's a, that's a very fine. I'm, the Isla scotches will do just fine. <laughs> And uh, come on by the ranch. We'll sit on the front porch, uh, drink some whiskey, and talk about how to save the world. <laughs> Sounds great. We'll see you there. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Adios.